irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Question Reality with Priscilla Leona, right here on LA Talk Radio. to Question Reality. I'm your host, Priscilla Leona, and we are coming to you live from Los Angeles, California. Our show is broadcast every Sunday from 5 p.m. to 5.50 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Now, if this is your first time tuning in, our show is going to help you to question your career reality. Now, this show is for you if you are considering a career in the entertainment industry. Our guests will provide you with tips, advice, and resource information on how and what it takes to successfully pursue a career in show business. And our guests work in various professions and they're at different stages of their career. So that means that we will definitely have someone on the show who will be able to help you with your show business career questions. If you want to check out our past guests, read their bios, listen to their interview instantly, or download one of the shows, you have to go to the LA Talk Radio website. And that address is latalkradio.com. And you click on the link at the top of the website that says Channel 1. Scroll down and look Look for the graphic of our show, and our show is, of course, Question Reality. Ding, 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 ding. And click on that link, and that will take you directly to our archive page. And that is where you can view the list of all of our past guests. And we have been on the air since 2008, and so we have a ton of people. So we have, we've had, just to give you an idea, so there's somebody for sure that you want to listen to. We've had Oscar winners, we've had Emmy winners, we've had Tony winners, we've had all kinds of winners. So we cover the full gamut. So you can hear from all of the top award winners. And then we go sort of the middle of the road and we have... uh working actors, professional actors, people who are working professionally in various types of careers. And then we try once in a while to hopefully bring on people who are just starting out so you can get an idea of exactly what the entertainment industry is like from when you're starting out all the way up until you've been on the red carpet getting your little Oscar. So I like to cover the full spectrum to kind of give everybody an idea of what it's like. So uh, that's That is what you can expect, and we have uh, singers and actors and dancers and models and musicians and directors and producers and behind-the-scene people like script supervisors and production assistants and set designers. So you're going to get not only uh, the the front-of-the-line people, but the the behind-the-scenes people. So there are so many careers in entertainment. It's not just being on television or the silver screen. Uh, There's lots of really great professions. So go to our archive page and uh, check that out. So there might be a career that you didn't even think you'd be interested in. We just had a wonderful lady um, on the radio show last week named Jennifer B. White. And one of the careers she had, she worked for God, I hope I get this right. Oh, I think it's universal. And she was a tagline uh, writer. So she used to come out with taglines for all of the movies that that uh, that was out, all the top A-list movies. So that was an interesting career for sure. Um, so go to our archive page. Again, channel one, scroll down, question reality, click on that link, and you can play all the uh, interviews instantly, or you can download them directly to your computer. Now, you can also download our free app uh, for your Android or iPhone, and you can listen to any of the other exciting and informative shows that is uh, on LA Talk Radio. We've got a ton of different uh, hosts that have have 
wonderful shows. I mean, if you have, if you if you feel that you might be a serial killer, there is a, a Dr. Michelle, I believe her name is, uh, Michelle Cohen. I think she can help you with that. Uh, I think if you have any kind of nymphomaniac problems, I think there's somebody there for you too. I think there's somebody there if you can't barbecue. Uh, there's someone if you want to learn guitar. I mean, it's just, there's so many wonderful shows on LA Talk Radio. So, uh, check it out. Really uh, great shows. So, you can download that app from our homepage on the LA Talk Radio website, and that's located towards the bottom of the page. So, definitely get your app so you can listen to all the shows. And of course, me every week. You want to listen to me, correct? So, get that app. Now, our shows are also available for download on iTunes under the podcast section, and we're also on Stitcher.com. So, just go there, type. Uh, question reality radio in the search box and there you are now if you want to find out about our future guests as you know we are always booked six months to a year in advance we've become so popular thank you thank you thank you and especially thank you to my huge audience in slovenia don't ask i don't know how we became popular in slovenia but if you only knew the emails i get when a guest comes on the show they have lots of things to share about how they felt about the Yes, so uh, thank you, Slovenia. We love you. Thank you. I don't know how it happened. Uh, anyway, we are on, again, iTunes, Stitcher.com. And if you want to find out about our future guests, visit the official website, which is the Question Reality website. And that address is questionrealityradioshow.com question reality radio show dot com also if you uh, we are booking for the second season now so if you have a friend or if you work professionally in the entertainment industry and you feel that you could come on and provide sage advice to our audience we would love to have you on so go to our website question reality radio show dot com and uh, go to the contact page and submit your website and all the information so we can connect Consider you for a spot, and it's an excellent venue to promote your uh, business or to promote yourself, because one thing about the difference between terrestrial radio and internet radio is with terrestrial radio, because I used to be in the media buying business, uh, it will cost you a fortune if you have to uh, do a spot on radio. I mean, we're talking thousands of dollars, and you do it, a 30-second will cost thousands, a 60-second will cost more thousands, and then it's on, like, one time and that's it so you spent thousands of dollars as a company and that's it you only get it for uh 30 seconds 60 seconds one fantastic thing about internet radio is that once you are on an internet radio show it will stay on their archive page for indefinitely and your advertisement will be on there so uh we have literally hundreds of thousands of listeners, uh, millions as a collective radio station. So it's really great to advertise on internet radio, Uh, not just, of course, my show, but any show on internet radio, um, because you you will definitely reap the rewards for, for sure for a great business. So consider that. All right. Now, without further ado, we have a wonderful guest. As you know, every week we have special, special, special people, but this is a special, special, extra special, triple special guy. His name is Michael Nicklin. He is a talent manager, a very hot, sexy, may I get in there, talent manager, probably the sexiest I've ever seen. Uh, I'm actually going to ask him to send me an autograph poster and, of course, hide it from my husband in the bathroom in the medicine cabinet, but a very sexy guy for a talent manager. Um, He owns, he's CEO and founder of Vortexian Talent uh, dot com. Go to Vortexian Talent dot com. He's also on Facebook under Vortexian Management. So let's go there now and pull up his website. And if you are interested in what you see, by God, if you're an actor and you think you got what it takes, 
se- hit the contact button and send your information. Now, for Taxi and Talent Management, this is a boutique talent management company. And what they do is they provide strategic career management and development to entertainment artists, uh, artists at varying stages of their career. So, We'll talk about what stages. I don't know if he's like me where he does beginning, intermediate, and advanced. But if it says varying stages of their careers, that's what I think that it means. But we'll find out. Now, this company was founded by, again, Los Angeles-based talent manager Michael Nicklin. And what he does is he brings decades of experience from both inside and outside the industry to the development of the artist's brand and business and overall well-being. And if you're going to pick a talent manager when you're out there seeking representation, you definitely have an advantage if you can get a talent manager that has both inside and outside experience. And we'll learn more about that. So uh, let's talk to him now. Michael? Michael Nicklet, you hot little sexy thing, you thank you for coming on my show. Priscilla, that is the most exciting introduction I've ever had in my career. Oh my God. Well, you know what? I wish I could make it more exciting because you, I was so excited at the thought of you coming on the show because I heard all about you and then I had to see your picture and I'm like, Jesus, God, this man is so gorgeous. He looks like a model. (laughs) So then I had to find out a little bit more about you and sure enough, you were, uh, I believe, and please, if I get anything wrong, just correct me, but I do believe that you were an actor back in the day and we can totally see it now I know you're a native of Southern California here's what I know about you I know that you used to be an actor so you've got the inside scoop on what that's like uh, from that perspective but now you've gone on to open up a boutique talent management company but let's start out back in the beginning when hot sexy little Michael Nicklin was a boy (laughs) in just some knee socks and patent leather shoes and this is where i'm where i'm going with you I'm, I'm picturing you now as an adult in patent leather shoes and socks i'm a very sick woman thinking that you're just going to be sexy in patent leather shoes and socks but when you were a child uh what did you see yourself being or doing when you grew up you know how we all thought of ourselves doing something you know i wanted to be wonder woman what did you see yourself doing I think the best way to to illustrate the answer is as a child of probably six or seven years old, the day after Halloween, I set up a table in my parents' front yard to sell my Halloween candy to passersby the day after Halloween. So from the earliest age I can remember, I had that entrepreneurial drive to create businesses, to make money, to help people start new businesses, and quite frankly, it it never stopped. Well, I've you been know, uh, an entrepreneur my entire life. I I heard that you've been referred to as a serial entrepreneur, not a serial killer, but a serial <laughs> entrepreneur, and that uh, you've uh, again, you, as you stated, you've been an entrepreneur for your entire adult life. So. Uh, my question is, why did you decide to work as an entrepreneur rather than working in the corporate world? I've been asked that throughout my entire career, and I keep searching for the best way to answer it. And the reason that I say that is that I think the traits that I have as a person guided me very early on to entrepreneurship. I not only am not afraid of risk, I actually enjoy risk. I've always believed that in the phrase high risk, high yield. So I like high yield endeavors. So I'm always looking for opportunities and um, business enterprises that have a little bit of risk associated with them. I also love change. Um, I have something on the bulletin board in my office that says, make change your only constant. Mm. I constantly uh, embrace change. I invite change. And I think in today's culture, which is changing every nanosecond, 
those skills really helped me in business. And I, if, if the truth be known, I am a bit of a control freak. And um, being a self-employed entrepreneur gives me ultimate control. I am the person running the ship. I'm going to be responsible for my wins, and I'm going to be responsible for my, uh, my losses, the, the home runs and the foul balls. So having control, feeling that I have more control of my own destiny is probably the third thing that I would say drove me early on to entrepreneurship and really kept me there. I haven't, I haven't had a boss since high school. I've been the boss since high school, and that spans several businesses, but it's, it's definitely not something for everybody. You know, well, there, you know, there are people... Th- go that, ahead. That, you're psychic. You're psychic because I. my next question was, what do you feel are at least three characteristic traits to be a successful entrepreneur? Um, I think you covered them already, but maybe you could do three more. <laughs> Well, I think the the most important traits in either becoming an entrepreneur, trying your first self-employment venture, or choosing that path is the, the things that I mentioned definitely are important traits, but I think also preparing yourself for the ups and downs that are inherently going to happen, either being driven by the economy or being driven by the stage that your particular business is in. And being able to sort of metaphorically weather those storms is a real important uh, cornerstone to entrepreneurship. Trying to, uh, I chose to create a through line economically so that on good years, I didn't overspend, and on lean years, I had money to carry me through so that I wouldn't um, really feel the burn of that roller coaster ride quite as much. And being able to do that and make those choices early in my career, um, before the thought of family or um, real estate or all of those other things that can really demand higher earnings, um, I was able to take risks that sort of, you know, set the path. Are you talking about investing, investing your money so that you could have a retirement fund or what, what, what are you talking about to have your little nest egg so that you could be an entrepreneur? Because being an entrepreneur, okay, for, okay, for example, if you, what advice would you give if, if you attempted a career as an entrepreneur and it just isn't profitable after you've tried everything you know to make your business succeed, what would you recommend to this person to do when they're at their wit's end, just say, <laughs> it just isn't happening. What do you do? Well, I think the, the important, it's a great question. The important thing is not to wait until you're at your wit's end to, to make a change because being on solid footing is very important um, to the entrepreneur, to the, to the startup business person. I would say that the most important thing to do is to pivot. Don't be afraid to pivot your concept. For example, we probably have all used, and I, I'm a big fan of Groupon. And oh, I love the, Groupon! Oh my God, my husband thinks I'm insane. Oh, the founder, the founder of uh, Groupon. In fact, Google Groupon um, pivot or Groupon startup, and you will see that the founder of Groupon had founded another internet company that was not doing well at all. And out of that office, decided to try this early stage idea with online couponing that became Groupon. So if he had stuck to his original idea, he might have ended up closing the doors on that idea and perhaps going back into uh, an employment situation. And instead, he did the pivot. And he pivoted his concept, he tried something new, he listened to his customers, and, you know, the rest is history. We all use our group on. So, so you're saying have a plan A, B, and C, basically. If your first dream career doesn't work out, then maybe your second idea, which may be a hobby, might end up being the thing that makes you successful, correct? Yes. Great. 
Great. Now, what what do you believe has given you, Michael Nicklin, the confidence to succeed as an entrepreneur? Because not, I think that if everybody, I, well, may not everybody, some people love working in the corporate world and they like doing the nine to five, but I think most people, if they had a choice, they'd like to be an op- entrepreneur, but not everybody has the confidence to get out there and risk it all. They're not high risk. What do you feel that gave you the confidence to do that, to know you're going to succeed as an entrepreneur? I was never afraid of failure. I was raised by my parents to, A, believe in myself, and B, uh, if I fell, get back up, and I'll equate falling to failure. And from the earliest stages of business, I embraced the failures for what they taught me, for what I learned from them, and applied those rules the next time. So rather than getting underneath the failure, and this, this goes straight through to today, you know, in counseling um, actors and performers, there's, there's a, a lot of failure or the feeling of failure to be had in this count, as you well know. And right. I think another important thing is to embrace the small victories. I remember the corporate culture that I first created in my first business, and we celebrated every small victory. Now, you might, you might not picture how small I'm talking about. Literally, any small victory got celebrated because we all realized how challenging it was to create any victories. And I think that positive attitude of focusing on the goal, not getting underneath the obstacles, respecting the obstacles, but not getting underneath them and celebrating the victories that you achieve are some of the most important things to keep in mind through that journey of entrepreneurship. Absolutely. You know, when you were 25, and I hope I got this this right, but uh, the data says when you were 25 that you transitioned from being an actor to taking on a position as a managing partner at the talent agency that represented you, which is really weird. I've never, ever even heard of that. That's like an amazing opportunity. Um, First of all, uh, I guess, you know, being an actor, which I try to emphasize to, to, to people listening to this show, that if you choose to be an actor, you are... In in essence, being an entrepreneur, because you really need to think of yourself as a business. You've got to be the marketing department, the networking department, the sales department, the accounting department. But a lot of actors don't... They don't want to focus on this. They don't. They don't think of themselves as an entrepreneur. They don't think of themselves as a business. They just want to focus on the craft. And I think that that's a, a huge mistake to not uh, focus on getting the business aspect. They really need to focus on the business aspect. So obviously, you at one point um, chose to be an actor, and then at some point you decided to make a career change so how did this opportunity one present itself and two why did you make this career move well i was um, i started um, modeling and doing television television commercials when i was in high school and that continued on through supporting myself through college doing that and i went to college up in silicon valley at san jose state so i was represented as a uh, model slash actor in the South Bay in Silicon Valley and by an agency in San Francisco and then uh, sort of part-time by an agency down here in Los Angeles while I was living in Northern California. And with the agency in the South Bay area in Silicon Valley, the agency was sort of gaining a foothold at a time that the dot-com world was was starting that all of the startups in Silicon Valley, Hewlett Packard, Apple, all of those companies were using um, talent for their industrials, for their commercials, for packaging, etc. So it was it was a great little agency that was getting a lot of work, and I was very fortunate to be one of their um, highest working talent in the agency. And one day the phone rang. And one of the two women that owned the agency 
said that she was getting ready to run for political office and that she did not want to continue to own the agency as she went down that political path and asked me if I would be interested in acquiring half the agency. Well, you know, here I am, a, a kid at 24. I was uh, just out of university, and I had already started another business previous to that. So I was really up to up to my neck in in business already, and it it seemed impossible the amount of money that that she was looking to get for half of the business was an impossibility for me. I didn't want to incur more debt in taking out a loan. And long story short, we were able to make a deal happen. And literally 24 hours later, I was a SAG after a franchise talent agent and no longer a talent in front of the camera because, of course, that would have been a conflict of interest. Right. So it, oh. it, uh, it literally happened overnight. Well, I, gosh, you, you <laughs> I'm telling you, every single thing you're talking about, it's like, how does he know that I have that question coming up? I didn't even send him the question. Oh. No, uh, you, I, I tell you, we, we're connecting, we're connecting here. Uh, what, uh, okay, so uh, I don't know what time period you're talking about um, when you were 25 because you look, you don't look a day over 26, so I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that now in the business, uh, in order to be an agent, you uh, and of course th- things change every every year. So I'm not currently up with what it is now. But at the last check that I did, uh, in order to be a talent agent, a legitimate talent agent, you had to be bonded. And I believe that it was uh, at a cost of $50,000. You had to have, uh, that's how much the cost was to be bonded. So back then, what was that still the case? You you had to, to yeah. spend, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was, it was the same. Um, SAG then, um, SAG and AFTRA, now combined, of course, to SAG AFTRA, was as diligent with their agents back then as they are now. So, okay. yes, we, we needed to be bonded and. Um, so, so you every, had to come up with. That's a- expected now, we had. So you had to not only come up with the money for the agency that the lady was asking, but you also had to go through the process and uh, come up with the fifty thousand dollars to be to be bonded as well back then, right? Yes. Wow. So when Amazing. I when I say it happened overnight, it didn't quite happen overnight. The agency acquisition happened overnight, but for me to go through all of the necessary the um, hoops to become uh, franchised as an individual agent by SAG after it took a little bit more time, but we were active with the unions um, immediately because of course both previous partners in the agency were were individually franchised um, prior to that. Amazing. And and once you put up the fifty thousand bond, is that still uh, is there a time period where that runs out, or is that indefinite, or do you have to pay an annual fee to be st- to keep that to keep that position or that title or that credit credibility or how did that how does that work? The if you think of a bond of like an insurance policy that has to be in place throughout the entire history of the operational history of the agency so that the talent is protected in the event that the funds that you receive from a client are dispersed properly to the talent. So uh, that that insurance, that that trust money, that money that is held in trust for the talent by the agent is going to be there, um, is protected, is is something that SAG after is very adamant about and I commend them for that. So it's sort of like an escrow and who is the who is the who are the people, or what is the company that keeps the, the bond in escrow, so to speak? Do I don't recall who we actually used at that time. Uh, oh. the, uh, I haven't been an agent in quite a number of years, and as a manager, we are not under the jurisdiction of SAG-AFTRA, nor do we collect and hold in trust any money for 
for talent. Mm-hmm. That's done by the agent. So I'm a little bit out of touch on who the um, surety bond companies are out there right now. Got it, got it. Now, when you were an agent back then, can you tell the audience what, or actually not back then because I'm sure it, it's changed a little bit, but uh, a lot of people, especially beginning actors, they get very confused between what a talent manager does and a talent agent, and they think that they're the same occupation, they're the same person, which they are not, and can you explain for the audience the differences between the daily duties of being a talent agent and a talent manager? I'd be happy to. The, the duties and responsibilities of a talent agent are to go through all of the breakdowns, the descriptions of the work that is submitted online to breakdown services by casting directors, and then match up the talent on their roster with those jobs, which is a monumental puzzle. And my hat goes off to agents every single day for what they have to do at the beginning of every day. So the, at the highest level, the way to describe it very succinctly is that the agent is responsible for getting jobs for the actors. The manager is responsible for assisting the actor in managing their career which may involve two, three, sometimes even four different agents and various levels of the career from the time before the talent has an agent to the time that they are trying to juggle relationships with three or four agents and require uh, everything from financial advice to legal advice to simply having to decide between two film or television projects that offer very different opportunities and it's a different type of advice than an agent prefers to give or even has the time to give because the agent is trying to get the individual talent in the room in front of the casting director, the producer, the director to get that job for which they get their commission. Okay. Now, a lot of, and and I see this, and I don't know if you've heard of this or been exposed to this, but I just hear all kinds of stories. And a lot of, especially people who come here to be actors and they're not familiar with what goes on, like the scams and things that are going on, they get sucked into these relationships with people where someone is acting or they say, I'm not going to say they are, they say that they're not only an agent, but they're a talent manager, and they are going to do this for you and that for you for the fee of this and that. Can you explain how you cannot be an agent and an actor at the same time, and you can't be an agent and a talent manager at the same time? Because these these inexperienced actors are signing, I don't even know how you could have a contract for that, but I have heard horror stories where they meet these people and they sign these contracts and the people do nothing for them, but then when the actor books the job, they get like 10% of their their little measly salary, is even if it's being, uh, usually it's, it's people who are being an extra. Can you please uh, give some advice, tips? and uh, explain why you can't be an agent manager and actor at the same time? Yes. The, the most important thing for a new talent to keep in mind, to understand, is that agents work on commission, managers work on commission. There should be absolutely no upfront fees charged to the talent for anything in that relationship. The agent and manager should have an arm's length with any resources they provide. They should not be collecting money on behalf of a resource like a photographer or an editor for their demo reel or um, any, you know, casting workshops, anything like that. All of those are separate relationships that the actor should have. So the agent earns 10% when the talent books a job that the agent submitted them for and the manager earns a percentage of the earnings across the various agent relationships from the talent in compensation for managing the career. Now, a talent manager 
their fee can fluctuate. They can charge from a minimum of, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, it could be a minimum of 5% all the way up to 20, a maximum of 20%. Is that correct? Yes. Generally, um, most managers are in the 10 to 15% range, and you see a great deal of the managers within the music industry going into the 20% range. Mm -hmm. but, for, but for managers for film and television, for actors, um, generally it's 10 to 15%. Mm -hmm. And there is starting out... Um, I try to tell, uh, actors seem to think that they're going to be walking down the red carpet with an Oscar five minutes after they, they hit Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, if only they can get a manager or an agent uh, to help them. And we know, realistically, that this is not necessarily the case there are people who come here and they're absolutely like adonis and venus and they're gonna get work right away so they can get an agent or manager and they can book and become celebrities but normally that's not what happens so can you can you stress to actors how they shouldn't be focusing as soon as they get here on finding a talent manager, an agent, and if they do that, they might most likely get a lot of rejection because the legitimate talent agent is not going to take someone on who has no credits and absolutely no experience. And can you, can you reinforce how important it is to build your acting portfolio and your resume and your craft before you start seeking representation? Because a lot of people think they should just be represented it and they have no training. I think the most important thing for an actor to do is to attempt both tracks. In other words, there is nothing wrong with getting a manager or an agent when you first arrive in town if you're fortunate enough to be able to get one because the amount of work that you will be exposed to with an agent is going to be a different type of work than you will be able to get on your own through the online casting websites, LA Casting, Actors Access, etc. However, if you are straight out of either drama school or university somewhere in another state and then move here feeling that everything is going to happen quickly because you've paid your dues in school, that's where the, you run into some problems because it doesn't happen quickly in spite of what has been seen or illustrated on some reality shows. And the, there are no shortcuts. So as you said, which is really important advice, getting the training and getting the experience is necessary. And the experience is not the experience of acting class. It's the experience of acting on set. And the best way to get that experience for a newcomer is the plethora of student films that are shot in Los Angeles. There are some great film schools that utilize actors all the time, and it's an opportunity not only to get the experience of working on set, but also gaining footage that will be really valuable on the actor's demo reel and using it for performance clips to submit to casting directors. And both of those tracks, the agent track where you're actually going out on professional audition and the pre-agent track where you're trying to get the credits and get the experience that will appeal to an agent and or a manager, that should be happening simultaneous upon arrival in Los Angeles to any acting classes or workshops that you're taking. Because some people that move to town that don't have family here, that uh, don't have a sense of community, find that sense of community in acting class, and then two or three years later, wake up in acting class to realize they've never been on a film set, they don't have any footage or any on-set experience, they again have the experience within what I call that bubble of the, of the acting class, but not the real-world experience. So 
doing both simultaneously is what I recommend. Not doing one, meaning the, the classes, and then starting to try to apply the experience on set. What can, now you have, Vortexian Talent is a boutique talent management company. Uh, what can an actor expect from you as a legitimate talent manager? Sorry, Chris, I because a lot of actors. That last part? Oh, oh, a lot of a lot of actors uh, just starting out. If they uh, are lucky enough to get a legitimate talent manager, such as yourself, and you have a boutique talent management company, what can an actor expect from a talent manager? Like what? Are, because they don't. Sometimes the uh, actors don't realize that there are lines that they cross asking a talent manager to do things that a talent manager is not supposed to do, but they don't know what they should and shouldn't be expecting. So, what are some things that an actor shouldn't think or expect from a talent manager? And what are some of the things that they should expect from a talent manager? Like, why? Why do they need a talent manager? Why? The, the most common thing that actors um, get confused about the relationship between agent and manager is that if they cannot get an agent, they look for a manager and then expect the manager to act as an agent and get the, the breakdowns and send them to casting as an agent would do. And that is not what a manager does. Now, there are many managers, including myself, that work with agents, and we support the agent's effort to get the talent the work. But it's the agent's job to submit the talent, and most managers actually do not um, embrace the idea of reviewing the breakdowns every day and acting as agents because we're not agents, we're managers. The biggest challenge is that um, I I was speaking with SAG a few weeks ago and was told that there are about 68,000 SAG after actors in Los Angeles. There are just about 300 agents to serve them. Now, what that means is that if we divide up that number equally, that every agent has to have between 250 and 300 actors on their roster to make the math work for every SAG after actor to have an agent. Now, that's not even including non-union talent. And there are, of course, hundreds of thousands of non-union actors in town as well. So the, the manager's role is to help guide the career of the actor. So if the actor does not have an agent, the manager can help them find and build the relationship with the agent. The, act, the manager should serve to be the, the counselor or the advisor to the talent so that they have the help and the camaraderie to navigate the business aspects of the business so that they can focus on what they most likely are in it to do, which is to act, to be the artist. And as I'm sure you know, there are many artists who have an inherent disconnect with the business side of the business, and it's the business of show. That's why it's called show business. So the the manager is the business representative, if you will, for the talent, and the agent is the headhunter for the talent. Right. The job seeker. But a lot of actors, exactly what you just said, and I'm so glad you pointed that out, they they try to get agents, and honestly, a lot of times they just don't have the resume, because legitimate agents, I mean, you come in there, you do your audition, if, you're, if you don't fit the part, you just don't fit the part, you get rejected, so they, you have to deal with the rejection and move on, that's just the way it is, but a lot of times when they're not booking, I've had a lot of, probably it's just, we're just cutting in and out 
cellular connection. Uh, a lot of actors go on auditions. They don't book the auditions. They don't know what's wrong. They don't know why they're not booking the auditions. And they get advice from other actors to go and seek out a talent manager. Like that's going to be the end all be all. And that's going to help them get an agent, which is not the case. So if you are not booking jobs when you get right directly in front of an agent uh, and you try to get a manager, why would a manager take you on when you're not booking on your own in front of the in front of the uh, agent for the parts? Why would a why would a talent manager take you on? That's a fantastic question. The there are two uh, types of talent that I look for. I look for established talent that I feel has the potential to break through into the next level because they have laid the groundwork and done everything right. And they just need that guidance to help get them to that next stage. There are other times that I call developmental talent where I see the potential in a talent. I can see it in their headshots. I can see it in the work that they've done in student films or in uh, you know, local commercials in the city that, that they came here from, and they just need a bit more polish, marketing, tailored, targeted experience to be able to get in the door with an agent. So it's taking the talent on, on speculation that they are going to continue on that path to get the tools to improve the skills to be able to earn the money because any time we, we as managers take on a talent, oh, and this applies to agents as well, if they're not working, then the time we are investing in working for them, we're doing it pro bono or we're doing it on spec because we don't get paid until the talent earns money. So if the agent or the manager feels that the talent does not have earning potential, immediately, they become a business expense or a liability to the agent or the manager because time is being spent on the talent and there is no cash flow being earned. Exactly. What can you, what can you, how can you guarantee a happy, profitable relationship between you as a talent manager and an actor? What are, what are some things that you're going to tell your clients to do in order that it doesn't turn into a disharmonious relationship where they're saying you're not doing anything for me and then you feel like they're not doing anything for themselves? The, the most annoying thing that I hear from talent is that their agent is not doing anything for them. And the reason that I say that is that unless you are in the agent's office and you are observing them navigate the hundreds, if not thousands, of breakdowns that come from casting directors electronically each day and trying to match those up with talent and then communicate with that talent to get them to that audition, it is a massive undertaking. Typically, an actor believes that if they are not being sent out, that that is the responsibility of the agent. So the first thing that I ask an actor that um, complains about their agent's speak is to say, when did they ask you for new headshots? How old is your current headshot? Why does your demo reel look the way it looks? Did your agent suggest that you do anything when you signed with them that you have not done? And I'll go down the checklist. The advantage that I have is I was an agent for 14 years, so I know what agents need. I know what they ask for. And in many cases, the talent feels that they can sort of skip over that if they don't have the money to shoot a new headshot. Um, I came across an actress a couple of weeks ago who had changed her hair color her hair length, and her weight varied about 15 to 20 pounds from what was in the photograph. And this individual was still using all of those marketing tools to market themselves. Well, the agent is not going to send that talent out if they know that when the casting director invites them to the audition, 
they're not going to look at all like the person in their marketing kit. So these are the types of things that come into play when an agent is not actively marketing the talent. And those are the things that we work on directly. That's the manager's function to make sure that the marketing package, meaning the, the headshots, the demo reel, the physical appearance, is in the prime position that it can be for the manager, uh, for the agent to send them out to the casting director and know that when they get them in the room that they're going to deliver. Now, you, do you, you, uh, you being Vortexian Talent Management, do you take on uh, or do you consider actors that are uh, SAG and non-union or just SAG-AFTRA or what is your criteria to take on an, an actor? We manage both SAG-AFTRA talent as well as non-union talent. I think that there is a very strategic time that it is beneficial for the non-union talent to join the union. However, there is a tremendous amount of work, as we all know, in town that a non-union actor can do. Uh, I mentioned student films earlier. There are SAG waiver experimental films that are no budget or ultra low budget. All of these things are very important to the actor's experience, and many of them can be done while maintaining a non-union status so that that expense that they incur in joining the union can be deferred until a strategic time. There will be a time when the actor absolutely should take that plunge and join SAG-AFTRA, and their earnings potential will run. So will the company for the job. So it is a career phase that we, we really discuss the timing of. Some actors that will come to town, they'll do extra work, um, accumulate their actors with the goal of trying to join the union as fast as possible. And then they go into a bit of culture shock as a union member because they don't have the resume, they don't have the video assets that have been accumulated through um, the earlier stages of the non-union and the SAG waiver work. And they have a tough time breaking into that next level because their their goal was to join the union, and that wasn't a piece of a strategic goal. It was their sole goal, and that it may have happened a bit too early. Absolutely. Well, my God, Michael, I tell you one thing. I have sadness in my heart because I have like 17 more questions that we did not get to and the time has come as they say on the Carol Burnett show oh. I'm so glad we had this time together can you believe 50 minutes went by like that Michael can you believe it in the blink of an eye thank in you and an thank eye. you for all you do on the show with, oh my God. with for, for people for artists in town because the guests you have on the information you put out there is stellar. So kudos on continuing to prompt everybody to question reality in this crazy business. <laughs> I like how you got a plug in there for me. I love that, Michael Nicklin. Well, may I beg you to come back on our show because I have so many more questions. As a matter of fact, while I'm talking to you, I have so many tweets coming in with questions. I got so many questions that are coming in. I have personal questions. I got people asking. I'm so sorry, actors, but I'm getting all these emails now from people asking questions to you and I'm so sorry but we can't answer but how about if I beg Michael to come back on again Michael would you come on in uh, it would be my pleasure oh my god thank you so much okay everybody I get your emails I'm getting your tweets I know Michael's going to come back on we're going to have him come on in maybe May or June whenever he's available thank you Michael uh, Michael Nicklin from Vortexian Talent please go to his website again VortexianTalent.com Facebook Vortexian Management thank you Michael Nicklin God, I can't say your name. I'm drunk over here. I feel like I'm drunk. Thank you, Michael Nicklin, for coming on. We're going to see you in May or June to answer all these questions, and uh, I'll be sending people your way. Thanks so much, Priscilla. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week on Question Reality. Bye. <laughs>
You're listening to Question Reality with Priscilla Leona right here on L.A. Talk Radio. 